Um, I'd like to begin by asking some, uh, a few questions, and just by a show of hands, um, if you can respond to that. The first question is, how many of you, and there's no condemnation here at all, how many of you have ever bought a lotto ticket? Can I see, how many of you? Only a few of you, my goodness. Well, I have, I can tell you, I've bought about four or five. I even won one something, won something once. All right. Uh, and those who bought the ticket, how many of you actually won the big prize? No, nobody, oh, all right. How many of you really expected to win that prize when you bought the ticket? You really expected to win it? <laughs> good. But did you really expect to win it? Ah, good. Were you disappointed when you didn't get it? Ah. And the rest of you, were you very disappointed? No. How many of you would have been surprised had you won it? You'd have been surprised. Oh. <laughs> yeah. What does this really tell us? That when we bought those tickets, there was little real expectation of winning. It was just kind of wishful thinking, a nebulous sort of hope, or perhaps as Ingrid called it, hope with a little H. And hope with a little H does little to ease our fears and our anxieties and our worries and our cares. In fact, hope with a little H does nothing really to change our outlook and our approach to life. We just continue as we always had before. However, hope with a capital H does improve our outlook on life. It does change our approach to life. It does bring a deeper sense of purpose and peace to us. Just by way of example, Alison, <clears throat> you, you don't know this, but Alison has been struggling desperately financially. Really, really, really. Can't uh, just to scrape together the money to pay for her electricity bill and, 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 and put some food on the table and that. She's really at her wit's end, she's been deeply distressed, deeply worried, deeply anxious. But then one day, she receives an email from some uh, firm of attorneys in the United States that tells Alison she has been left a bequest of $10 million. Well, of course, she said, well, somebody's just having me on here, being miserable. I mean, I'm already struggling and that and that. They just, you know. Anyway, she decides she'd just go online and see. Uh, and <clears throat> she pulls up this firm and, wow, there's the logo on the, on the letter that she's received and all the information. And on the, on the uh, internet, it's exactly the same. She said, wow. So on impulse, she decides to phone them. The last of her airtime, of course. And she gets hold of the young secretary on the other side in the States and says, you know, um, this is who I am and I'm phoning because I've received this uh, 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 email from you. Um, and the young secretary says, well, hang on, let me put you through to the relevant attorney, please, which she does. And she introduces herself. I am Alison Warren. And the attorney says, hang on, yes, yes, I know, hang on, wait a minute, and let me just pull this up, please. And he pulls it all up, and he says, oh, yes, Mrs. Warren, you're from South Africa. Yes, indeed. And, she, and he gives her all the details of her life. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yes, you do have 10 million, rand that has, uh, 10 million dollars that has been left to you. 
But it is a very big estate, Mrs. Warren. And it is, it's going to take us about three years to wind it up. But in three years' time, we'll get hold of you, get your details and transfer the money to you when it's all ready. What does this do to Alison's outlook on life? What does it do to her sense of anxiety and fear and worry? It alleviates it, doesn't it? Suddenly, she has an outlook of hope. Hope with a capital H. But hang on a minute. Has Alison's situation changed here now in the immediate? No. It's exactly the same situation. But you see, hope with a capital H enables us to face the present in the confidence of the future. In other words, to engage with the uncertainties of today in the certainty of tomorrow. It changes our attitude toward the situation that we find ourselves in. And we approach it from a very different perspective. Now the writer of Hebrews tells us, the writer of Hebrews tells us, faith is the confidence of things hoped for, the certainty of what is not seen. The confidence of things hoped for. Alison is now absolutely confident of that $10 million. No doubt. It's coming. Now I know that the King James says faith is the substance of things hoped for. And various translations um, give different words. But most of them, like um, confidence here, this I think is the NIV, um, assurance and things like that. Uh, <clears throat> the word that is translated here that, um, I'm not entirely certain where NIV, uh, where uh, King James got it, but hypostasis is the Greek word, hypostasis, and it means to stand under. So faith is to stand under the hope of things, uh, 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 sorry, under the, what am I trying to say? The, the things hoped for, thanks, thank you. I'll get there just now, don't mind. Uh, to stand under, we wouldn't use that term, we would use to stand on. Faith is to stand on the things hoped for. In other words, it's that confidence that Alison can stand on that $10 million. She knows it's coming. It's the confidence that we have. And confidence gives rise to expectation, and expectation gives rise to hope. The extent of our hope is always determined by the degree of our expectation. Where there is little expectation, there is little hope. Or perhaps hope with a little H. And it brings little peace into our situation or the circumstances that we find ourselves in. And Paul was aware of this. And he says in his uh, letter to the Ephesians, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Know the hope, not just as a theory, not just as a concept, 
not just as an abstract idea, but as an existential reality. Know it. Know it as the very foundation of our life. If our hope is to be any hope at all, we must be grounded in it. We, this, this whole series, <clears throat> um, the, the title was Hope Has a Name, right? Um, <clears throat> and, and, and of course, we all know the name, don't we? Anybody tell me what that name is? Jesus. Ah, oh, thank you, yes. And the scriptures allude to this in so many, many different ways. But Paul actually spells it out very definitively, in fact, in his letter to um, um, Timothy. In the uh, opening statement, he says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the command of God and our Savior, command of God our Savior, I beg your pardon, and of Christ Jesus our hope. He is our hope. Now, We need to be grounded. We need to be rooted in this hope. In other words, rooted in Christ Jesus. Rooted in him. You know, Christ in you, the hope of glory. We need to be rooted in him. This is not a distant hope, far removed from us. You know, you've got to swim the Atlantic Ocean to find it over in the States. Well, Alison might have to. Um, It's a very present hope. I want, I really, truly, I don't know how to impress upon you this. This hope is right here, right now, right inside of you. Christ in you. The hope of glory. And this is why Peter says to us, in your hearts set apart apart Christ as Lord. In your hearts. There is often a tendency and I understand it, to put Christ out there somewhere. But where is he in truth regarding you or relative to you? Right here. Closer to you are to you than you are to yourself. In your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. But he goes on and he says, always be ready to give an answer to those who ask of you the hope that lies within you. Just a question. How many people recently have asked of any of us of the hope that lies within us? Not many. I wonder why that is. Is it because they don't see it in us? I suspect that that's the truth. And the consequence of this is that we are answering questions no one's asking. Because that hope is not evident in us. And if truth be told... isn't exceptionally high in our own lives either. It's a kind of nebulous hope. It's kind of far removed. And this is just my understanding here. But I believe that we will only truly experience this hope 
to the extent to which we embrace our faith as a lifestyle and not simply as a belief system. To the extent to which we live this faith from within, not just discuss it, debate over it, preach about it, read about it, study it, think about it, but actually live it to this extent and only to this extent will we truly become rooted in Christ Jesus and know this hope. Then it will be foundational to our life and evident of course to those who are around us but what is this hope what is it that we can set our heart and mind on with absolute certainty Well, what it isn't is a life of ease. This is not what it's about. I've just listed a few things here. Um, more comfort, more possessions, more money. Can't talk about these, no time. Uh, more popularity, more recognition, more acceptance, more, 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 more. This is the way of the world. It's the accumulation of what is external because we're internally feeling empty. This describes what I would call the hopeful pursuit of the man of the world. And to a large extent, we... <clears throat> who have been shaped so much by our culture rather than by the gospel, tend to adopt the same pursuits and values and attitudes. But this is not our hope. Paul again says categorically what this hope is uh, in his opening statement to Titus. This is how he begins. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness, a faith and knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised from the beginning of, I beg your pardon, before the beginning of time. Our hope is eternal life in Jesus. It is the certainty that in Christ we have entered into eternity. We have stepped out of time. We may yet be living in time, but we have stepped out of time in terms of who we are and are now, if you will, creatures of eternity. Those who will never die. I don't know if you really, really have, have you ever really thought about this? I'm sure some of you have thought about dying. No? Well, you're never going to die. Bad luck. What did Jesus say? He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And he who lives and believes in me will never die. This is our hope. This is the context in which we are to live 
our lives. You are, please hear this, you are an eternal being in Christ Jesus. You are. And all the problems and the issues and the troubles and the worries and the fears that you face right now, in 10 years' time, you now listen, it's only three years' time, in 10 years' time, where will they be? In 20 years from now, how important will they be? In 40, 50, 60 years, 100 years? A thousand, 10,000. We're swamped by problems and issues because we see them, please hear this, because we see them as greater than ourselves. When we measure ourselves against our problem, we quail because this is bigger than I am. But forgive me, that's nonsense. It's not bigger than you are. You are an eternal being. And in just a few years from now, all those problems, all those worries, where are they? See them in the context and face them in the context of who you truly are. Can't develop it. What is the basis of our hope? In other words, you see, Alison's basis of hope in her $10 million is the, well, I suppose first the letter that she got and then the say-so of that uh, attorney that she spoke to. And so she's assured of it. What is the basis of our hope? Ah, scripture's full, and much could be said about that, and again, time doesn't permit. But here's something that for me, really, 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 it just, it clinches it for me. It is the last word spoken by Jesus on the cross in John's gospel. Tetelestai. It is finished. Or if you will, it is done. It is completed. To really appreciate that, go back to John 4, uh, women at the well, uh, and <clears throat> the disciples go to buy food, come back to, and then Jesus doesn't want the food, and he said, no. Um, and they said, well, who's fed him? And he said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me, to finish his work. Again, in John 5, he says the same thing. And then in, 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 in John 17, in the high priestly prayer, I think I wrote this thing down. Yes, uh, I have glorified you. This is the high priestly prayer. He's speaking to the Father. I have glorified you on earth. I have finished the work you gave me to do. And then from the cross, it is finished. It is finished. Now it's difficult to be absolutely certain about the outcome of something which is still in progress. Some activity that's, you know, what's the exact outcome going to be? But once you have come to the end of it, once it is completed, once it is done, once it is finished, you know there's no need for speculation anymore. You know. And that for me is the foundation of my hope. It is done. Finished. And of course, this could just refer to, uh, just again, uh, well, 
obviously, it, it, Jesus speaks about his own mission. That is finished, isn't it? It's the completion of God's plan and purpose for us. That is finished as well. But it also speaks of the atonement of sin, victory over death, reconciliation of man to God, access to God's grace, personal salvation, your salvation, and access to the very throne of grace as well. You see, all the promises of God have been fulfilled in Jesus. And this is why Paul says, for all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen. And then the writer of Hebrews says, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. This hope. Our hope is in the promises of God fulfilled in Jesus. By his death and resurrection, we are assured of our own salvation and our own resurrection from the dead. Again, the writer of Hebrews says, we have come to share in Christ. That which God has done for Jesus, he has done for you and me also. In Jesus, through Jesus. There is a proviso here. We have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly till the end the confidence we had at first. Or if you will, if we hold firmly to the hope, that confidence, the hope we had at first. And Paul says, for in this hope we are saved. But then he continues and he says, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In other words, and this is important, we wait for it patiently. The implication here is that there are going to be ups and downs. Allison is still going to face several economic issues before that $10 million comes. But she can wait for it patiently. She can weather the storm. She can weather the bad weather, if you like, on the basis of what is to come. I've got to be careful how I say this. I'm trying to think of doing it as diplomatically as I can. I may be wrong, <clears throat> but for me, nowhere do I see in Scripture the promise that our journey with Jesus is going to be a walk in the park. That everything is going to go the way we want it to go. That it will always turn out, I think the term is hunky-dory. Nowhere does it say that. I know many people do preach that and teach that. But Jesus himself actually warns us to the contrary, doesn't he? Um, in fact, these are the last words that Jesus speaks to the disciples, or certainly the last recorded words in John's Gospel that he speaks to the disciples before he is arrested and crucified. Uh, now remember that um, chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 in John all take place in the evening prior to his arrest and, of course, then his crucifixion the next day. Uh, <clears throat> and he closes off those five chapters with this statement. 
I have told you these things, all that he's explained, so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. There again is our hope. Our hope is not the promise of an easy path through life. That is not our hope. We are going to face difficulties. And much can be said about that too. Time doesn't permit, forgive me, we'll skip it. But as we become increasingly more rooted in Christ, and as we learn to live from, if you will, that the platform of that assured hope, we will be increasingly able to say, uh, together with Paul, Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles, do you know what Paul's light and momentary troubles were? Ever looked at them? Ever had a, been stoned, anybody been stoned recently? Whipped? with a cat and nine tails, beaten with rods, chased by Jews, chased by Gentiles, chased by crooks, in the, in, uh, shipwrecked, and eventually had his head chopped off, actually. Um, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Can't help but remember Jonathan's but those who were here uh, at Jonathan's memorial, his, his uh, little video that he put, wow. There you saw the expectation, didn't you? Wow. Okay, uh, so sorry. It far outweighs them all. So, please hear this. Listen carefully. So, we fix our eyes not on what is seen. In other words, not on the issue, the problem, that which is troubling us at the moment. Don't make this the central issue of your life. Don't allow this to usurp your entire focus and to suck you in. So we don't fix our eyes on what is seen, but on what is unseen, that hope. Since what is seen is temporary, and what is unseen is eternal. By fixing our eyes on what is unseen, we will learn to navigate the uncertainties of this present moment from the certainty of our eternal future. And as we do that, we will come to realize that our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that outweighs them all. And I'm going to end there. There's other stuff to talk about. Uh, I'll just give you one more heading. How do we root ourselves? How do we root ourselves in this hope? It's all very well for me to tell you, root yourself. Be rooted. How? And the answer to that, and we won't talk about it, but it is, are you listening carefully? It is my prayer that the leadership will consider the subject, prayer. And that we will give ourselves six to nine months at least, maybe a year at least, talking about this prayer. Rooting ourselves in our hope. I close.
close with a word from Paul. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.